morning. I'd like to welcome you here to First Presbyterian Church. If you're a guest with us, a special word of welcome to you. We actually have a gift bag that we want to give to you after the service. If you go to the welcome desk, we'd love to give this to you. And there's a great tumbler inside that'll keep your coffee warm for quite some time. and allows us to get to know you better and tell you about all the great things that God is doing here at First Presbyterian Church. This is a good time to take that friendship pad that's located near the center aisle. If you can begin to fill it out and pass it down the pew, and you can take note of those who are seated next to you, and later in the service, you can actually greet them by name. Well, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please rise and join me for our responsive call to worship that comes from Psalm 62 this morning. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. On God rests my salvation and my glory. God is a refuge for us. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that in Jesus Christ we know that we have a Savior who is with us, who will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who guides us and leads us in all truth. Oh God, we pray that by your Spirit you would guide us this morning so that everything we say and do might bring glory and honor to you. We pray this in the strong and precious name of your Son, who is the Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Please continue to join us in singing our opening hymn, number 442, Take Time to Be Holy. Please be seated. Well, Thursday we had the great gift of snow. It was beautiful how it covered the ground and made everything looked bright and beautiful. Of course, the warm weather came and the snow melted, and then we had slush. Didn't make everything look beautiful, the slush. In fact, my car was quite filthy. And that's kind of the way our life is. You know, we might come to worship and feel holy as we spend time in communion with God, but then we go through the rest of the week and There are things that we say that we maybe should not have said. There are things that we do that we should not have done. And there are things that we fail to do that we knew we probably should have done. In the Bible, that's called sin. The Greek word for sin is amartano. It literally meant to miss the mark. It was an archery term as an archer would miss the mark on the target. We don't always do what we're supposed to do. And sometimes we fail to do the things we, we should do. In fact, John in his epistle, his first epistle, writes that if we say that we have no sin, we simply deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
But if we will confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, promises us that He will forgive us for all of our sins. So I invite you to join me in the corporate prayer of confession that's printed in your bulletin, followed by a time of silent, personal confession. Please join me as you pray. Gracious and loving God, we confess that we can be easily distracted by the things of this world rather than listening to Your Word first. We know that we should spend time alone with You, but we confess that we do not always make the time we need to be still and know that You are God. In Your mercy, please forgive us for our many sins, for we confess that we have sinned against You in thought, word, and deed by the things we have done and by the things we have left undone. In Your mercy, please cleanse us from all unrighteousness and hear us now as we continue to confess our sins to you in silence. Lord, as we come to you in humble confession this morning, we come seeking your grace, mercy, and love. And we thank you, Lord, that you have already demonstrated your great love for all of us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the price for all of our sins with his death on a cross. And then on the third day, he rose again, conquering both sin and death on our behalf, so that we might know with full assurance that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven that in Jesus Christ we have eternal life, that in Jesus Christ we have a new life as we are led by your Spirit. So God, we thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Christ as we confess our sins to you. We pray this in the strong and precious name of your Son who is the Christ and all God's people said, amen. My friends, that is the good news of the gospel. God does not abandon us in our sin. No, God actually became one of us in his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lived a life of perfect obedience so that he who is without sin took on the sins of the world when he died on a cross as the perfect atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. And then on the third day, he rose again, conquering both sin and death on our behalf, and he appeared before his disciples as the resurrected Jesus behind locked doors and said to them, peace be with you. In gratitude for God's grace and forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ, let's now stand and pass the peace of Christ to one another. Peace of Christ be with you. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. This morning's Old Testament reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verses 27 to 33. It can be found on page 95 of your pew Bibles. And the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, 
Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Matt. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you know that we're in the middle of a sermon series for Lent called Sacred Rhythms for Lent, where we've been looking at different spiritual practices. Uh, We began with Ash Wednesday, talking about the importance of confession as a great spiritual practice, that as we confess our sins to God, we are reminded of His grace and forgiveness, and we can be even better instruments of God's grace and forgiveness to others as we've received that grace and forgiveness. We looked, of course, at uh, Matthew 4, 1 to 11, how before Jesus even launched His public ministry, He spent uh, 40 days fasting and praying in the wilderness in solitude and and ultimately feasting, as we talked about, on the Word of God. Because when Satan tried to tempt uh, Jesus, every time He was able to respond with a a word from scripture, Scripture, either quoting Deuteronomy 8 or Deuteronomy 6, reminding Satan that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then yes, last Sunday, we looked at the spiritual practice of the spiritual rhythm of, of silence and how important it is for us to be still before the Lord so that we might hear God's voice as we read His Word and we spend time talking to God, but also listening to God, that we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. As we continue that sermon series, I want to look now to the spiritual practice of solitude. Uh, so I want you to turn in your Red Pew Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 16. It may be found on page 1096 of that Red Pew Bible, Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 16. But before I read God's Word, let's call upon His Holy Spirit again to guide us in the reading and preaching of His Holy Word. Please join me as we pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank You that You inspired Luke to investigate and interview others to get an orderly account of the life and the teaching and the ministry of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that as we look at these words this morning, that you might speak to us, that we might hear from you, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your holy sight. Through your son's precious name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 16. Now, before I begin to read this text, I want to give a little bit of context of what happened earlier in Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, we get the story of how Jesus goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, which would be Saturday for Jews. It was the day of holy rest and worship, and this was Jesus' habit. He went to the synagogue every Sabbath, and while he's in the synagogue, a man with a withered hand comes forward, and the Pharisees and the scribes are wondering, what is Jesus going to do? Is he going to heal this man with a withered hand? I mean, it's the Sabbath. It's a day of rest, not a day of work. And and Jesus can tell what's going on in the hearts and the minds of the Pharisees and the scribes. And so he asks them directly, tell me, is it lawful to do good or to do evil harm on the Sabbath? Well, none of the Pharisees and scribes, despite their many years of study, have the courage to answer Jesus. And so Jesus looks at the man with the withered hand, and he says, stretch out your hand. And immediately, the man is healed. And then we read in Luke chapter 6, verse 11, these words. But they, they, Luke 6, chapter 11, but they, the Pharisees and scribes, were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Because Jesus has challenged their understanding of the Sabbath and healed this man on the Sabbath, now the Pharisees and the scribes want to harm Jesus. So what is Jesus going to do? To see how Jesus responds to this evident threat, let's read Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 16. Listen to God's Word. In these days He went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, 
whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who is called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Here ends the reading of God's Word as the prophet Isaiah tells us, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our Lord stands forever. This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you ever feel like you have too much to do and not enough time to do it all? I feel like that pretty much every day. Every day I wake up and I look at my little calendar and I go, man, I got a lot to do and not enough time to do it. In fact, I felt that way for about 18 months. You know, I've been so busy. I just, it's been unbelievable how busy I have felt. And yet, as I've been taking time, hopefully you've been joining us in this five by five reading plan. Uh, we gave these to everyone on Christmas Eve. And if you don't have a copy of this, you can pick it up in the back table. As we've been going through the New Testament, basically we ask everyone to read one chapter of the New Testament uh, five days a week. It only takes about five minutes to do that. And then we ask you to look at the five questions on this uh, reading plan and ask those questions of the text. As we've been going through this reading plan, you know on Thursday we finished the Gospel of Matthew. And of course, we've already the, read the Gospel of Mark, and now we're beginning the Gospel of Luke. We read Luke chapter 1 on Friday. And what's impressed me as I've been reading through these Gospels is just how much Jesus was able to do in such a short amount of time. Do you know the Gospel of Mark, which just really talks about Jesus' earthly ministry, his public earthly ministry, covers three years. In three years, Jesus was able to do so much I mean, as you read the Gospel of Mark and Matthew, you remember that he cast out demons, countless demons. He would uh, heal every sick person who came to him with a disease or an infirmity. It was incredible how much he was able to accomplish. He, he preached to the masses. You may remember he, re he fed over 5,000 people with just five barley loaves and two fish. He fed over 4,000 people at a different time. I mean, he was amazing. He would calm storms. He would walk on water. He even brought the dead back to life. How is it that Jesus was able to do so much in such a short amount of time? And most importantly, Jesus died on a cross as the sinless sacrifice for all of our sins. And then on the third day, he, he rose again. How was Jesus able to accomplish so much in such a short amount of time? Well, if you've been with us, you know we've been looking at these sacred rhythms, sacred rhythms of confession, silence, Fasting, which we talked about really fasting is feasting as we, the time that we normally eat food, we want to feast on the Word of God for man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen? Amen. And so as we spend time in God's Word, you know, we're, we're nourished. But another sacred rhythm of Jesus specifically is the rhythm of solitude, being alone with His Heavenly Father. We saw this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. Right after being baptized, Jesus goes into the wilderness where he fasts and prays, and he's alone with God his Father, talking to him, praying. We see this in the very first chapter of Mark's gospel as we were reading through the gospel of Mark. In the very first chapter, Mark 1, verse 35, we read how after going to Peter's house and healing his, Peter's mother-in-law and healing all the people who were sick in that town and who were coming to him, it says, and rising very early in the morning... While it was still dark, he departed and went out to the desolate place, and there he prayed. Jesus had a rhythm of doing great works and then going away to pray. After he feeds the 5,000, he dismisses his disciples to get in a boat, and then he goes away to pray. And, of course, his disciples get way out into the lake, the Sea of Galilee, and he walks on water to catch up with them. But before he did that, he had spent time alone praying. We see this in Luke 5, the chapter right before the one I just read. Luke chapter 5, we hear the story of how a, a man with leprosy comes to Jesus and asks to be healed, and Jesus, in all compassion, touches the man and heals him, and he tells him, hey, go back to the priest so that you might be declared as clean, but tell no one that I have done this for you. And then in Luke chapter 5, verses 15 to 16, we read these words, but now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he withdrew to a desolate place and pray. 
but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Now, why did Jesus make an effort to always pray alone? I mean, are we only supposed to pray alone? Well, we actually know from the Sermon on the Mount when we receive the Lord's Prayer, which is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, that's a corporate prayer that we're called to pray together. In fact, we'll be praying that together here in a moment, where we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's our Father, not my Father, but rather our Father. This great prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is the model prayer for all of us has been given to us so that we might pray it together. And yet, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus talks about prayer, in Matthew 6, 5 to 6, we read these words. And Jesus said, And when you pray, Matthew 6, 5 to 6, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Yes, we know that Jesus is telling us that, yeah, we should pray corporately, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, but we should also be praying alone having some time in solitude, in a prayer closet perhaps? Do you have a place that you like to go where you can pray and and be alone with God? Where you can talk to God alone without the, the distractions of others or the noises of others? One of the reasons this is so important um, is pointed out in Dallas Willard's great book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. I made reference to this last week, and maybe you've already bought it, which is great. I don't get any uh, royalties for pitching this book. It's a really good book, though. And I would encourage you to get your own copy so you can underline it like I have done my own. We have one in the library, but please don't underline on that one. But uh, it says in, in, in his book, on his chapter on solitude, he says, In stark aloneness, it is possible to have silence, to be still, to know that Jehovah indeed is God, to set the Lord before your mind with sufficient intensity and duration that we stay centered upon Him, our hearts fixed, established in trust, even when back in the office, shop, or home. Yes, it's important that we spend some time alone with God so that we can be focused without the distractions of all the other noises that can fill our lives. Do you have a place that you can go where you can be alone. Maybe it's a favorite chair in your house where you know you can sit and be alone at a certain time. I know for me, my place that I go is our kitchen table, but it has to be at 5.30 a.m. Otherwise, people are awake and they're making noise, but at 5.30, no one's awake but me and the dog, and he goes outside, so he doesn't bother me. And I'm able to listen and meditate on God's Word and hear God's voice as I read and I pray. Do you have a place you can go? We can see in our text that Jesus went to the mountains. He often went to the mountains to be alone with his father. That's a a common place. And I know I love to go to Palo Duro Canyon. We won't have mountains right away nearby, but we can go to Palo Duro Canyon and and spend some time out in God's creation. And in that time of creation, spending time listening to God. If you're not used to the rhythm of solitude, spending time alone, you might just try 15 minutes a day. I hope this reading plan is helping you find that time of solitude where you can find a place, schedule it, Have a rhythm of it. Maybe it's always in the morning, or maybe it's always in the evening, or maybe while you're driving your car, but ideally you're in a place where you can sit still and just focus on hearing God's Word, not also driving. No, solitude is intended to be a place where we can be still before the Lord in one-on-one time with God. Ruth Haley Barton has written a great book called The Sacred Rhythms, Arranging Our Lives for Spiritual Transformation, where she talks about solitude. We have this book in our church library as well, but Again, I would encourage you to get it. It's a great book. But uh, she writes this about solitude. Solitude is a place. It's a place in time that is set apart for God and God alone. A time when we unplug and withdraw from the noise of interpersonal interactions, from the noise, busyness, and constant stimulation associated with life and the company of others. Solitude can also be associated with a physical place that has been set apart for times alone with God, a place that's not chattered with work, or cluttered with work, noise, technology, other relationships, or any of those things that call us back into doing mode. Most important, solitude is a place inside myself where God's Spirit and my Spirit dwell together in union. Do you have a place where you can go and be alone with God? Do you have a regular time 
of going to this place. It's the breakfast table for me. It might be a favorite chair in your home for you or the back porch on a good weather day. Not only do we want to have a, a regular rhythm of having daily solitude with God, but it's important to have even extended time. As we can see in our text, Jesus went to a mountain and spent the whole night in prayer, several hours alone with his heavenly Father. Do you have a place you like to go to spend several hours alone with God? I mentioned a moment ago I like to go to the Powder Canyon, go hiking. Um, I might have earbuds or no earbuds either way, but I'm listening to Christian music while I'm doing praising God, or I'm just walking, listening to the sound of creation. I love doing that. Or I love going to New Mexico. If I'm into the northern mountains of New Mexico, I like to hike a trail by myself. Lots of water, lots of water. Or uh, Colorado as well. But it's important for me to schedule this. It doesn't just happen on its own. I have to be very intentional. In fact, in uh, May, uh, May 2nd, I'll be in Colorado Springs in order to pick up our speaker for our all-church retreat, which is May 3 to 5. Uh, we're going to be going to West Cliff, Colorado again, Horn Creek, Sky Ranch, great, great uh, facility there. Hope you can join us May 3rd to 5. Uh, we'll, we'll be that first weekend in May. But before I pick up our speaker, I'm going to go to Glen Airy. In fact, I think we've got a picture of Glen Airy, which is outside of Colorado Springs. Isn't that beautiful? You can sign up at Glen Airy for a day alone with God, is what they call it. It's D-A-W-G, dog. And they give you this little devotional guide that has different psalms, and they encourage you to walk different trails where you can be out in the midst of creation and just spend time listening to God's voice, time alone, trying to hear God and connect with God to recenter your heart and mind on God. And I'm doing that because I'm going to Colorado Springs anyway to pick up uh, our speaker, Jim Singleton. I think we had a picture of him. If you haven't signed up, be thinking about that, May 3rd to 5th. Uh, Jim Singleton was actually our Morris preacher several years ago. He spoke in this pulpit. He was the senior pastor at First Pres Colorado Springs, a great guy. He's going to give us a great message from the Word, May 3rd to 5th. But while we're in places like Westcliff, Colorado, or like when the women's retreat goes to Santa Fe or the men's retreat goes to Santa Fe or Glorieta in the fall. When we take these retreats to these beautiful places, we don't want to just be in fellowship with others all the time. We want to take some time to be still alone with God in solitude as Jesus did. You know, it's interesting to me as Jesus is now feeling the pressure of knowing that the Pharisees and the scribes want to harm him. He doesn't go running to his disciples. Where he goes running first is to our Heavenly Father, to a mountain where he can be alone with our Heavenly Father in prayer. I love what our uh, good friend, eco-pastor Doug Rumford has written a book called Soul Shaping, From Soul Neglect to Spiritual Vitality. He writes of this about the importance of solitude. He says, rather than drawing from the broken cisterns of the world, Solitude brings us to the reservoir of living water supplied by the Holy Spirit. This water sparkles with purity and refreshes us with the cool, uncompromising time, taste, taste of things beyond our present physical world. Do you have a place you can go where you can drink from the living water that Jesus came to bring? You may remember that in John 4, when a Samaritan woman is at a well, Jesus it meets her and he offers her living water, that if she'll drink from this water, she'll never thirst again. It's in time alone with our Heavenly Father, with Jesus, that we get to experience this, this great peace that he came to bring to all of us. Do you have a place you like to go? And do you have a time you like to set aside? Ideally, we have some daily moments, daily rhythms of time of solitude with God. But what about scheduling a regular day or half an afternoon, whatever it might be. Richard Foster and Dallas Willard both recommend that we try to take at least one day a quarter every three months where we could be alone with God, whether that be a Saturday or Sunday or maybe even a work day. Sarah Klein, who's a longtime member, Matt's wife, uh, has uh, told me many years ago about what she likes to call a Jesus day, where she'll take a day off so she can be alone with Jesus. And this is what she writes about her Jesus day. My Jesus days, I usually take one or two a year, I try to be aware of how I'm feeling emotionally, mentally, and take one when things are off. I make sure to have the day to myself so I can focus on God. I slow myself to wake naturally. I stay off all technology, TV, computer, phone, except to listen to a sermon or worship music. I see it as a literal day with Jesus. Just as if I was spending a special day with my child or spouse, I make it all about communicating with God. I read scripture, journal, listen to worship music, and actually worship. 
listen to a sermon, take walks, or even hikes at the canyon. I try to speak to God continually and look, listen for ways He is responding through Scripture or even the natural world. Sometimes I decide to fast, other times I don't. It was slightly awkward the first time I did it, but I needed it so much. The awkwardness went away. Now I see these days are true blessings, and I look forward to them. What a great example of a Jesus day. Taking a day off work. So I might take a day just to be with Jesus, or taking a Saturday to just do that, or taking a Sunday. I'm just going to be alone with Jesus, going at the rhythm of Jesus, not with technology, not with television, not with phones, but just with Jesus, being alone with Him, as Jesus had the rhythm of being alone with His heavenly Father. As Jesus is feeling the pressure of ministry and the fact that now the Pharisees and the scribes want to come after him and harm him, what does he do? He goes to a mountain. The first thing he does is he goes to a mountain to pray. And we're told this, in these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. Now, in the Scriptures, we sometimes use and think of the word disciple and apostle as if they're the same thing. They're actually not. A disciple is a follower or a student or a pupil, or we might use the term apprentice today, someone who is learning from a leader, just like a plumber. Before they can become licensed, they have to apprentice under a licensed plumber plumber for many years. The disciples were disciples. They were apprentices, and we're all disciples, all of us who are trying to learn from Jesus. But among the crowd of disciples, those followers, those apprentices, Jesus chose 12 to be apostles. And the Greek word for apostle, the root of that word is actually, it's a verb, it's to send. And so the idea is the apostles are the ones who are sent. And I've always wondered how that conversation went with Jesus on the mountain alone with His heavenly Father talking to God about what he needs to do now that the Pharisees and scribes want to harm him. I can imagine Jesus looking up up to heaven and saying, Abba, Dada, Father, the Pharisees and the scribes, they want to harm me. What should I do? And then our Heavenly Father looking down at his son Jesus with whom he's well pleased, saying, well, Jesus, just as I chose 12 tribes to help lead the people of Israel, I need you now to choose 12 men who will be your apostles who will preach the gospel, whom you can train so that when you have to go, they can continue the mission. Now, who should you choose, Jesus? You should probably start with Peter. He's always very eager, maybe a little impetuous, but goodness, he's got a good heart. Now, it's true, he's going to deny knowing you three times before the cock crows, but he's going to be regretful for that. And once you reinstitute him into his role of leadership, you'll find him to be faithful, faithful to the very end. In fact, he'll be crucified upside down because of his love for you. Of course, if you pick Peter, you got to pick Andrew, right? That's Peter's brother. You got to pick Andrew because of the Sylvian rivalries that they have. And speaking of brothers, you're going to need to pick James and John. Those are all fishing buddies. Everyone loves John. And James will be a faithful apostle. He'll be the first one who willingly dies for his faith in you. But I got to warn you, their mother is a bit of work. She's got high ambitions for her sons, James and John. She's going to come to you and tell you that she wants her sons, James and John, to sit at your left hand and at your right, but that's going to be a teaching moment where you can explain to her and all the apostles that you as the Son of Man came to this earth not to be served, but to serve and give your life as a, a ransom for many. And that's why I need you to choose Judas, Judas Iscariot. He's from the Judah town of Kerioth, the town of Kerioth in the region of Judah. He's the only non-Galilean. He's going to keep the money, and the greed is going to get the better of him. And he's he's going to betray you for 30 pieces of silver, but that's a fulfillment of prophecy. Yes, I need you to choose Judas, because one is going to betray you, one who breaks bread with you, and he's the one who needs to do that. But the other disciples like Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew, Matthew the tax collector. I know no one's going to like him initially, but he's a pretty good writer. You're going to want to keep him around. And then there's Thomas, and Thomas, of course, he's got lots of doubts. He, for him, seen as believing. But then you'll show him, and he'll come to believe, and he'll actually bring the gospel all the way to India. 
And there's James, the son of Alphaeus. Simon, who's called the zealot. A guy who's seeking answers to life's problems and politics, but you can show him the better way through the kingdom of God. Yes, I need you to choose these 12 men to be your apostles. But what's key in these men is that you spend time with them just as you spend time with me. You need to spend time with these men for it's in time together that lives are ultimately transformed. My friends, it's in time with Jesus, time with Jesus alone, that our life is ultimately transformed. You see, as I have spent times uh, over 20 years now married to my wife, Sarah, in that time with her, I have seen that time together helps transform both of us. She's made me a sweeter person. Just ask her after the service. I'm a truth teller, but she's like, if you don't speak the truth in love, that doesn't help a lot of people. She's so sweet and kind and loving. Time with my spouse has made me a better man. Time with my children has made me a more compassionate, patient person. Yes, time with others, intentional one-on-one -on -one time with others can transform us, and same, the same is true with God. You see, if I want to really spend some quality time with my wife, I don't go on a double date. I go one-on-one. -on -one. I take her out one-on-one, -on -one and we talk and we share, knowing that we love each other and there will be no judgment. My friends, just as we take dates with our spouses or our girlfriends or whatever, we want to spend time one-on-one -on -one with the one who loves us more than anyone, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who showed us that there is no greater love than this than a man who is willing to die for his friends. Yes, God loves us with an unconditional, sacrificial love. And it's as we spend time alone with that loving God, that loving Savior, that we are transformed and we become more like Christ so that we can be better when we are with others. I love what Richard Foster writes in his book, Celebration of Discipline. He writes this, like Jesus, we must go away from people so that we can be truly present when we are with people. The fruit of solitude is increased sensitivity and compassion for others. As we drink from the living water that Jesus came to bring to all of us, as we spend time alone with Jesus in His Word, meditating on who He is, then we begin to experience His grace afresh and anew, and we can be a conduit of His grace and love to others. One little prayer I like to do as I begin my time of solitude with Jesus that time alone with Jesus, is I like to do a thing called centering prayer. You may remember I've talked about this a few years ago, but the idea is that you breathe in, and as you're breathing in, you hold that breath for a count of three or four, and then you breathe out saying the name of Jesus. And as we say the name of Jesus, we think about Jesus, just Jesus. I'm here with Jesus and Jesus alone. I think about who Jesus is and what He's done for all of us at the cross of Christ and how He conquered sin and death with His resurrection on the third day. And I know that in Jesus, the victory has already been won, and so I can come to Him with my, my burdens and my worries, and I know that He will carry that yoke for me, for His yoke is easy and His burden is light. So let's try that this morning. Let's do the, the Jesus centering prayer. I'm going to breathe in. If you could breathe in, close your eyes with me. We'll do it three times. And then as we breathe out, gently whisper the name of Jesus so our hearts and minds are centered on Him. Jesus. 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 As we spend time with Jesus, we experience His loving presence, and we're better when we are with others. I love what Doug Runford ends his chapter on solitude with these words about solitude and the importance of being time alone with Jesus. He says, being away from people for a time can enable us to engage more fully when we rejoin them. We give others that which God has given us. We cannot receive from God if we always have people around. But when we receive from the Lord, we become eager to share His bounty with others. My friends, I believe that one of the reasons Jesus was able to accomplish so much in just three years is because He had the regular rhythm of spending time alone with His Heavenly Father. 
He launched his ministry 40 days in the wilderness, fasting, praying in solitude, and feasting on the Word of God. I know that we can't all take 40 days off to do that, but we can see that before he chose his apostles, he spent an entire night in prayer. After healing so many, he went away to a solitude, a place of solitude, and he prayed. And on the night that he was betrayed, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and wandered away to pray alone, to meet and convene with his heavenly Father, saying, not my will, but yours be done. In time of solitude with God, we are able to give our burdens to God, and we can see that His will is the best thing for us. Please join me as you pray. Gracious and loving God, I thank you that as we look at the life of Jesus who invited each one of us to come and follow Him, we can see He had a sacred rhythm of spending time alone with you, our Heavenly Father. And it was in that time of solitude and, and prayer that He was able to focus on His mission and be rejuvenated within that time of refreshment. So if Jesus needed to do that, how much more do we? So Lord, each one of us, may we take the time, schedule the time, find the place where we can be alone with You and just focus on You and cast our burdens on You, knowing that You invite us to come just as we are. Come all who are weary and heavy laden, and You will give us rest. Take Your yoke upon us, for Your yoke is easy and, and Your burden is light because you're the one who carries it for us. So, Lord, just as Jesus found times to be alone with you, I pray we would as well, 15 minutes a day, maybe 20, 30, wherever it might be, but then we would also intentionally begin to find extended hours of solitude where we could be alone with you, maybe in the mountains or in a canyon or in the back porch or wherever you might call us to go, where we could be alone and be still and know that you are God. And that despite the worries and concerns we have, we can be reminded that you are in control and your will is the best thing for us. So we pray, not our will, but your will be done. Your son's name we pray and all God's people said, amen. In gratitude for God's amazing grace, let's continue our worship by giving God's tithes and our offerings this morning.
you all, like me, have received a number of emails and phone calls from people around the country asking how are things going in Amarillo as far as the fire and things. And um, we're going to pray for a number of families in our church that have ranches and things have been burned and cattle lost. It's fortunately, I haven't heard of any homes being lost in our, in our congregation, but I'm sure a lot of you all know folks in Fritch or other places that, that have. So we want to pray for a lot of the folks locally here. Um, our churches, we've contributed towards a fund uh, to help uh, relieve some of the families, and I, I'm sure you all have done some of those things as well. But we as a church family want to be supportive and helpful of others. May we pray together. Lord, we do thank you for your faithfulness to us. Uh, we are grateful, Lord, that we have a chance to uh, come before your throne and, and uh, pray. Lord, there are people in our community, in our larger community, that are, that are hurting today. And we, we know that. We've seen that. They've uh, lost, um, some have lost loved ones, uh, others property and um, animals and livelihoods. Uh, and Lord, we want to be helpful. Uh, we know that really the most we can do is pray. We can ask, Lord, for your hand to be at work, and uh, we know you are. Lord, we want to pray today for the uh, O'Brien family and the Boyce family, uh, the Charles's family, the Worsham family, Mitchell family, Cameron family, uh, Marsh family. Um, each of these folks, Lord, have been through some tough days, and uh, we ask, Lord, you'd be their comfort, encourager. Uh, they'd see your hand at work. These are many others, uh, Lord, who've um, experienced serious loss. So, Lord, we know that nothing separates us from your love in Christ and that you are at work, and we thank you, O oh Lord, for what you're doing. Lord, we want to pray for some our folks, too. They're going through some medical procedures. We, we want to pray for Virginia Socola, who will have a heart procedure on Tuesday, as will Dale Williams. Uh, we lift both of them up before you. Uh, for Betty Halliburg, and the following week, she'll have surgery as well. We want to pray for Betty. Lord, elections are upon us. We do want to pray, Lord, that your hand of grace will be at work in elections and uh, guide the people who you want to be in positions of authority. We do want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We think of peace in Ukraine. Uh, we think of war-torn places and breaks your heart as you see the tragedy that humanity fosters on one another. Lord, we pray for your hand to be engaged. Well, we want to pray as well for Gary and Mary Lee Hip. They're some of our missionaries who are uh, in Bolivia. We thank you for Gary and Mary Lee. We pray for their health as they're there for two or three weeks and equipping others to in whole life discipleship. So we pray for Gary and Mary Lee Hip this day. But we thank you that Jesus came in our midst and taught us to pray when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Worship is a participatory event. May you stand now, and we will use the words of the Apostles' Creed to state what we believe. Remembering the word Catholic means universal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. My privilege now to extend to each of you all uh, uh, to participate in the Lord's Supper. This is an open communion. The Presbyterian Church is an open communion, meaning if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are welcome to participate. 
So whatever background you might come from, we would love to have you a part of this a service and part of this communion. Now, also in the Reformed part of the faith, we believe in, the, uh, in communion that the Holy Spirit is present in a very special way. We don't believe this is literally becomes a literally body and blood of Christ. We don't believe it's simply symbolic. It's simply re- we're remembering. But we believe the Holy Spirit is here in a special way to speak to our hearts and minds. So we welcome the Holy Spirit to do the work that only he can do. I do like it. The officers are here to bring the communion to you, and I often say this, and I like that because I think it's also a little bit symbolic of God's initiating love towards us. Uh, we didn't decide to follow Jesus. He took the initiative towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died in our place. So uh, he is a holy God who uh, died in our place because of our sin and brokenness that we might be forgiven, we might experience newness of life, and he continues to reach out to us by his Holy Spirit. And in communion, we recognize that in a very special way, that he reaches out to us. So let me read the words of institution as it comes from, uh, this is 1 Corinthians um, 11. Hear God's word. For I receive from the Lord what I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he's betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So again, when you receive the elements, take the bread, and you take that yourself when you receive it, representing your own individual walk with Christ. But hold the juice until all are served, because when God calls you, he calls you into community, not as solo as individuals. So we are we're a community of believers following Jesus. So hold your juice until all are served, and I'll tell you when to partake in the juice. May we pray together. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that your spirit is at work in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you not only illumine our our shortcomings in sin, but then you convince us of the truth of the gospel, that Christ died in our place, that we are loved and valued, that your Holy Spirit equips and, and gifts your body to be about your work, O Lord. So we welcome you here, Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts and minds. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and also be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Again, Lord, we thank you for your presence. We ask that you would speak to us your mighty word that we might hear and obey. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. The officers now come forward.
Now, as the body of Christ, take and drink. May we pray. Lord, we do thank you that you um, meet us where we are, and, but you love us too much to leave us there. Lord, we thank that you are conforming each of us to the image of Christ in very unique ways. We thank you, O oh Lord, for all your work of grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we stand now for our final hymn. Quick announcements, if I could, before we leave. First, if you're a first-time guest here today, we're so glad you're here. Please go out the door to the left. We have a welcome desk there. We'd love to get a chance to give you a little gift to get a chance to know you better. Love the chance to do that. Well, uh, Holy Week is coming. Uh, Palm Sunday will be March 24th. We'll have our regular services, 8.30, 10.55, and 11.05 on Palm Sunday. And then that week, we'll have Maundy Thursday on the 28th at 7 o'clock. And then Good Friday will be on March 29th at 8 p.m. We'd love for you all to be a part of all that uh, goes on during Holy Week. Finally, we do have our uh, family, our church-wide uh, 
for all church retreat that comes on May 3rd through 5th. Now, we're, we're going to Horn Creek. That's outside of Westcliff, Colorado. It's a beautiful place. Love to have you. If you haven't been before, you will love being with us. It is a great, great time. So more about that soon, but please mark your calendars for March 3rd through 5th. And may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.